Thank you for joining us for this CNBC Africa debate coming to you live from the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Broadcasting live to 48 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Over the next hour, we focus on Africa's next challenge. The continent is home to nine of the world's 15 fastest growing economies. Yet, over the past 10 years, productivity has fallen. How will the fourth industrial revolution impact Africa? Joining me for what promises to be a spirited debate, Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. Hans Westerberg, President and Chief Executive Officer, Ericsson Worldwide. Halimariam Desalen, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. Akanwumi Adashina, President of the African Development Bank. And in a short while, Yemi Osinbajo, Vice President of Nigeria, will be joining us. Unfortunately, he's running slightly late due to his plane being delayed Welcome to the joys of live broadcasting. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. So broadly speaking, the fourth industrial revolution is about the convergence of man and machine. I'm borrowing here from the World Economic Forum. Digitization is changing the way that we do everything. Emerging technologies are being developed faster than we can govern them. But there is a key underpin to all of this, and that is technology. The African continent has an energy deficit. 645 million people do not have access to electricity on the African continent. That's just over half the total population. You need power to power technology. And without technology, you can't make those quantum leaps in education, healthcare, financial inclusion, agriculture. I was very fortunate to attend an event last night, and I'm going to throw now to President Adashina from the African Development Bank, who unveiled a vision for a new deal on energy for the African <coughs> continent. And we're going to start setting out that vision and how exactly we're going to execute on it. President Adashina. Well, thank you very much. I think we're talking about the, the fourth industrial revolution. And the first revolution was just simply a steam engine, right? Well, that is first, second, third, fourth, 50 industrial revolution. They all start with a basic thing, that you must have electricity. You say electricity is like the blood in your body. If you have blood, you, you leave. If you don't have blood, you don't leave. And what happens is that 137, 137 years after Thomas Edison developed the light bulb, simple light bulb, Africa is in the dark. Makes no sense. Right? You got today, you were quoting the figure about roughly 645 million people without access to electricity. Additional 700 million people can't even cook on basic things, right? Now, these are numbers that we know, and we actually think that this is not acceptable. And that is why I was very delighted that President Kagame and Prime Minister Haller Mariam and President uh, 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 Alpha Conde of, uh, of Guinea and our Prime Minister of Ivory Coast joined us yesterday and Mr. Kofi Annan when we launched the New Deal on Energy for Africa. What exactly are we talking about? First and foremost, we want to make sure that it's universal access to electricity by 2025. With electricity, then you can have industrialization. You can create jobs. SMEs, small and medium-sized businesses can work. Schools can be powered. Vaccines can go into hospitals and be saved. You know? And then Africa will not be known by the darkness of its cities or the darkness of its rural areas. Everywhere will be bright. You know? So that is fundamental to what we're talking about. And I think the next part of it is really about industrialization, and you were talking about it there. If you're going to have industrialization, take a look at our situation in Africa today. Africa accounts for 1.9% of total global manufacturing, right? We are here in Davos. Some of you may like skiing and all of that. If you literally have a skating board and you put it up on this platform right here, and that is Africa's share of global manufacturing, you can skate on it. It's flat. Came down for 3.4%. In the 1990s, today, 1.9%. So as we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, one thing that we must do is that make sure that whatever Africa processes, I mean produces, that Africa processes, whether it is minerals, metals, agriculture, oil, and gas, we can't be at the bottom of the value chain. We've got to get to the top of that value chain and process and add value. That's why that is the kind of industrialization that will create jobs for us uh, on the continent. And I hope that we'll be able to talk about that today and what kind of skills we need. 
uh, to be able we to make that happen. We're definitely going to speak about the, the skills and STEM cells in STEM skills in particular, science, technology, engineering, and maths. President Kagami, let me bring you in here. And President Adashina has already pointed out to the heads of state that were present in the room last night supporting the New Deal on Energy for Africa. Talk to me about the political will, sir, behind this initiative. Well, thank you. Uh, political will is really what is uh, at issue here, or rather politics, if you will. Maybe the political will is there, but in the end, doesn't translate into the many things we want to see happen in Africa and uh, beyond. Uh, I think the political will is there, especially in the recent times, uh, leaders, uh, in the government, uh, leaders in the business, uh, aligning their language and speaking the same language with a sense of urgency that something must be done. And I think we are discovering that uh, though too late, or we are trying to do what we have known for too long that should happen, and that is government has its role to play, businesses have uh, their role to play, and we must come together to make sure that we are practical in doing things, depending on how we are organized as well. So in actual fact, political will uh, is the starting point. Whether we realize the energy level and objectives we want to put in place so that energy can lead us to <coughs> realizing many other things, whether it is in manufacturing or uh, growing uh, of industries in different uh, sectors, energy is essential. But for that energy to be in place, of course, for example, in Africa, we have huge potential in various sources of energy. But it is not understandable why we are at the point we are after so long knowing that energy is so essential for other things to happen. So the political will and the politics and governance thereof should be what we look at so that these things actually happen. Because all ingredients are there. All things we have to draw from, or even the skills to put things in place, all of these things are there in Africa. So we need to probably examine deeper why <coughs> this political will doesn't really move as fast as we need. And I, I, I should say we need to move very fast. We're going to definitely talk about speed of execution. Prime Minister, I'm going to bring you in here. The vision clearly sets out that all Africans should have access to electricity by 2025. What are the key challenges? We've spoken about taking that political will, creating action, execution. What other challenges do you, do you see, Prime Minister, to achieving that objective? Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, first of all, I think as any nation does, Africa also needs to transform its economy. And that economic transformation needs um, a, a vibrant you know, leadership uh, in Africa. And lack of leadership is one of the main issue and, and a bottleneck. That impeding constraint has to be resolved. And we as leaders of Africa, we need to uh, you know, show up that we are up to the requirement this time. Because Africa has huge opportunity and it's becoming now a global pole for growth, uh, that opportunity has to be harnessed and we need to have, you know, sort out this challenge. We also know that there are a number of challenges in terms of, uh, you know, technology transfer skills and, uh, you know, lack of that capacity that needs to be uh, enhanced. And again, countries like Rwanda, Ethiopia, we have challenges in logistics and, uh, all kinds of those things. But the main challenge, again, is power infrastructure. Energy is the main challenge in Africa. Uh, it's also one of the challenges. Of course, there is infrastructure deficit <clears throat> in Africa in many ways. But 
the main challenge is to have a quality, uh, reliable energy source that makes industrialization possible. In my country, we have witnessed uh, uh, a double-digit growth for the last 12 years. And the need for you know, energy is growing by 25 to 30%, which is beyond you know, uh, the growth rate we are making in the country. So it means that we have to move very fast in energy development if we want to move again faster <clears throat> in the development. I appreciate what the, world, uh, the African Development Bank has launched, the vision of the president, which is very essential. And Africa has huge potential of green renewable energy sources, like in my country. And we have to harness this potential at this time. And we need the private sector to come in and engage uh, in developing this potential in the, in the country uh, we have in Africa. Again, we need to also see the good governance issue has to be addressed properly. You know, this is important. We can't hide that there is problem in good governance in Africa. We should have a zero tolerance corruption, and we should have a vibrant bureaucracy which helps the private sector to engage in. And we should also have uh, a political stability and macroeconomic stability that the private sector comes in and engage itself. So I think there are daunting challenges, but the two narratives that Africa is rising, and again, Africa is a doomed continent, is wrong. To us, Africa is not a doomed continent. Africa is, there are challenges, but it's a rising continent. We can address the challenge together with a political commitment today that's uh, emerging in Africa. Hans, the Prime Minister refers to engaging the private sector. Ericsson has been on the continent for 120 years. You've got some 3,000 people across 53 countries of the 54 in Africa. Talk to me about that private sector engagement and your your robust foray into the, or onto the African continent? Uh, first of all, I think that uh, <clears throat> there are a couple of things that are happening you know, on the continent that are extremely important for having economic growth and sustainable development. And uh, one is, of course, universal access to electricity, which is extra extraordinarily important. The others, of course, the technology that are spreading across the whole uh, continent. I mean, right now, 80% of the Africans has a mobile phone, which is just amazing how quickly it's gone. But that's slow compared to what we're going to see in the next five years. So we'll go from 70 million uh, people in Africa having access to internet to 700 million in 2021. So think about those two assets that now Africa is sitting on. They're sitting on electricity as far as it can come, and then, of course, technology. That is, of course, enabling the fourth technology revolution in Africa, start using the embedded technology for transforming industry, but not only that. I mean, doing things that some of these uh, uh, heads of states are doing here, transforming the society by starting getting digital healthcare, digital education, the inclusion, because all that will be important when we're going to have economic growth in Africa, and we just need to have that. But this time, we can pair that with sustainable development. And I think that's a unique opportunity that Africa has in this moment. Uh, many of the African heads of state are talking about smart cities, digital inclusion. We still lack the scale of it. We don't have the scaling of it yet. We still lack a little bit of the competence to work with governments to actually understanding how to do this using these assets. But clearly, the 21st century's infrastructure is coming into Africa quickly based on private investments, and that we see will continue. And I think it's more for us to work together, as President Kagame said, you need to work over borders here, because we have one part of the solution, the heads of states and the governments has another, uh, and of course, this, uh, society in large has to be part of it. That's what we see coming forward, and that's why I'm excited to be there for 120 years, and I have a plan to the next 120 years as well, for sure. I want to get a little uh, country specific now, again, to, to set some context. And uh, we're looking at a situation where the Prime, Prime Minister refers to Africa rising and the Africa doom and gloom scenario. Now, President Kagame, we've sat on this platform a number of years in a row, and I think that we're facing challenging times and potentially more challenging than when we sat here in 2015, in January 2015. 
Obviously, Rwanda is seen as a beacon of hope. It has transformed itself since the 1994 genocide. There's economic growth, there's development, there's digitization. But, sir, I need to ask you, given the external environment and the challenges, including falling commodity prices and the risk-off environment, what is keeping you up at night? Well, there are challenges all over the world, and they will continue to be there. They will always be there. But what keeps me up at night is uh, to try and do more and better uh, of what we are doing already. I think some of these challenges come with opportunities, including there is a silver lining around these problems. They make us Africans, at least in Rwanda, think harder and smarter. At the same time, these challenges remind us that there are actually things we should be doing that are within our means that we are not doing. Maybe we should just stop rushing out there for everything and anything. And also remember to carry forward what we are capable of doing. I'll give you a simple example. If you look at the levels of intra-African trade, very low. Now, while we also know that if we Africans traded among ourselves, cross borders, we would have a lot of gains in the growth of our GDPs. Is that intra-Africa trade still sitting at 12%? Well, if there is an increase, it is 1% or 2%, you know. So, but we need much bigger than that. So, and, and these are things that we don't have to wait for, and they, they are really not related to some of the challenges we are seeing outside there that we are worried about that are actually affecting us. So we could easily compensate for what we are losing that we've been gaining from outside by concentrating also on what is very close to us and that we can do between and among us ourselves, Africans. Ladies and gentlemen, as I alluded to earlier, the Vice President of Nigeria was delayed. He is now in the room. Please welcome Yemi Osin Bajo, Vice President of Nigeria to the stage to join our discussion. Thank you very much for, for joining us, Mr. Vice President. I'm going to give you a moment to breathe while I go to Prime Minister of Ethiopia and then to President Adashina. Let's talk again, Ethiopia specifics. As you alluded to, very high growth rate for the last decade, above 10%. Government is targeting, and correct me if I'm wrong, but above 11% for 2016. But softer commodity prices, are impacting the environment, and already your GDP, uh, agriculture's contribution to GDP, is probably falling back from about 40% to 35%. Do you still think you're going to make that aggressive growth target, and is it a direct result of your gro growth and transformation program, which is the second growth and transformation program you've brought into Ethiopia? Again, I would say that accelerated fast growth, which is broad-based and inclusive and shared is just, just not a choice for us. Because if we don't do this, you know, the poverty rate is moving very fast and it will engulf you so that there will be a huge problem. The history of development in many nations tell you that there should be something pushing you very hard so that you can move uh, very fast in economic development and deliver. So we put this, um, and we tried for the last 12 years, and we succeeded in doing so. And we put again for the coming five years to grow at a double digit. We know that the global economy is not favoring us in some way, but there is also huge opportunity for Ethiopia on the other side. In the ladder uh, of the economic development, emerging economies like China, India, uh, they are no more competitive in uh, leather-intensive manufacturing. It is the turn of Africa now. So Ethiopia has that opportunity we have to grab. 
even though the commodity price, of course the commodity price always will be volatile because you should add values on the commodity if you want to have a price that helps you to move forward. So Ethiopia is now focusing on becoming a manufacturing hub, especially in light manufacturing, uh, where we can compete better in the global market this time. So again, we have opportunity when there is some slack in some areas of you know, uh, the economy, there are also opportunities on the others, and we need to harness that opportunity to the maximum possible. That's the opportunity that the global economy gives us now to Ethiopia. So we want to attract more FDIs uh, from emerging economies and also other global partners. We have witnessed this and we are working very hard to facilitate like industrial parks development in Ethiopia with a huge vigor and companies like PVH and the big companies uh, from Asia, and, and, uh, Prime Minister, I'm going to interject in. there and I'm going to bring it to President Adashina because we cannot have a conversation about growth on the African continent without touching on agriculture and the potential to industrialize the supply chain, the value chain where agri agriculture is concerned. President Adashina, if you could comment also on what this will do for women. I'm not sure if you're aware, but half the farmers in Africa are in fact women. So. Well, uh, first let me uh, comment on what the two uh, presidents said and also the, the prime minister. I think they're absolutely right. Uh, when President Kagame was talking about uh, the need for Africa to diversify its economy, I mean, we have all these economic headwinds that are there, right? But they exist because of the nature of the, of the growth process. Our growth process has been commodity-based, right? And so, but when you export commodities, raw commodities, you're subject to those low prices, the volatilities of it, and the contraction in China is a big problem, and also the slow growth in Europe has also been a contracted problem uh, for us in Africa. But what we actually absolutely need to do is to agree on three things. First, I have never seen any country, or any region for that matter, that has actually developed concentrating on primary commodities, right? People make money at the top of the chain or at the bottom of the chain, right? And so what Africa has to do is to diversify its export mix, but also make sure whatever it exports, whether it's gold, whether it's diamond, whether it's copper, whether it's aluminum, uh, whatever it is, oil and gas, whatever it is, we've got to process that and actually be at the top of global value chains. That's the first thing. The second thing we have to do, and President Kagame mentioned this, is actually focus a lot more on regional trade. Now, if you take the continental free trade area that we have today, you know, which uh, in Africa, Southern Africa, we have the East Africa community and all that. It's one trillion dollars to time, right? And so if we are able to open up that, most of the exposure to global volatilities that we have will go down. Countries that actually concentrate a lot more on regional trade are less more likely to face a lot of those volatilities that you have. The third thing which I think is absolutely very critical is agriculture, which you mentioned. Today, Africa has 65% of the global amount of arable land left in the world to feed all of us for that well, I don't plan to be alive by uh, 2063 or whatever, 2070, but at least there's gonna be roughly nine billion people that we have to feed by 2050. And they don't smoke gas, they don't drink oil, you know, they eat food. And Africa has the capacity to do that. So we must unlock the potential of agriculture. These presidents are doing that. And so is the vice president from Nigeria with a new government there. But in trying to do that, the question we must ask ourselves is what type of agriculture? Agriculture is not a way of life. It's not, it's not a social sector, it's a business, right? And so we've got to make sure that we do commodity-based agro-allied industrialization of the continent. Today, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon produce 75% of the global supply of cocoa, right? The size of the chocolate market is $100 billion a year. Well, Africa accounts for only 2% of that, right? And so we have to set up agro-allied industries at home that process everything we've had into high-value commodities. That's the way in which you make a lot of money. And you talk about the issue of women. I am very passionate about women issues in Africa. Look, if you support women farmers with access to technology, access to finance, link them to markets, they can perform wonders. These presidents are all doing great things on that. And what we want to do as African Development Bank is I announced that uh, we at the bank, we're going to provide um, a facility of $300 million um, that will allow us to direct the financial institutions to lend more to women, and that will allow us to leverage $3 billion 
for women farmers and SME-based uh, women uh, businesses in Africa. We've got to unlock that potential of women all across uh, the African continent. And one last point that I think I'm going to uh, uh, make is the fact that, you know, political whip is critical. You know, yesterday when we had the new deal on energy and we had this president and everybody was there, we all agree with one thing that whether it's agriculture, whether it's SME, whether, I don't care whatever it is, without um, energy, we can't solve it. That political will is critical. And that's why I want to say that. We, we all agree that Africa is tired of being in the dark, right? Also tired of having discussions around beneficiation. We've yeah. been having that for yeah. years and years But and even years. having that discussion about beneficiation in the dark, because if you don't have electricity, Right, you can't fix any of this problem. And I'm going to bring, I'm going to take that opportunity to bring the Vice President up to speed. So a little bit of context. We've spoken at the outset of this debate about the New Deal on Energy for Africa, which was announced last night. Uh, we've then gone into a little context around uh, both Rwanda and Ethiopia. And obviously we've also chatted about the agriculture context. We've been waiting for you, sir to get a little bit of an update on the Nigerian economy. Now, uh, again, context there, President Buhari recently tabled his 2016 budget, working on an oil price of $38 a barrel. We know that the news headlines here at the World Economic Forum in Davos have been focusing on the fall in the oil price. It is now below $30 a barrel and counting. How is that impacting Nigeria? Well, um, first, let me apologize uh, for holding you up. Um, the, the truth is, uh, there's no way of not uh, being impacted by the falling oil price. I mean, we had initially thought uh, $38 was, was, was conservative enough uh, when planning the budget. But that's gone, as you pointed out, below uh, 30. But then for us also, there's a silver lining there because um, it means that we're not paying any subsidies which frees up something in the order of about $5 billion US dollars, which was a subsidy cost. So in terms of the budget, I mean, we're still working on the figures, but um, low oil prices also mean that there's some advantage there. But overall, we still have to think in terms of financing the budget, you know, and uh, we have uh, about $2.2 trillion, something in the order of about, I, I think, I think that would come down like four billion or so US dollars deficit, which has to be financed. And um, with the low oil prices, obviously we're going to have uh, some challenges with that. But we're looking at domestic uh, resource mobilization. We're looking at rep domestic revenues, uh, especially VAT, uh, extending the coverage for collection of VAT, and also um, customs, being more efficient with customs and general governance issues managing the whole, uh, the whole process of uh, government expenditure more, uh, more closely and, and with a lot more transparency. So we, th we think that um, with uh, adequate uh, governance around uh, budget management and around expenditure management, we can actually do quite a bit. We recently implemented some, uh, some uh, processes such as putting all of uh, the civil servants and all, all public servants on uh, an electronic platform, uh, which of course has also led to substantial savings. We've also done the TSA, the uh, Treasury Single Account, which means that all government revenues uh, come into, as it were, a common pool. And uh, the Ministry of Finance can, at one go, take a look at all government finances, see expenditure, see, see uh, receipts, and also be able to watch expenditure. Some, some, some of those will save us substantial sums of money. And I, and I think for us, governance is key, you know, transparency is key. And um, if we're able to, uh, to, to do those things, I think we might uh, be able to uh, come away with our under $30, although we do expect that some magic, you know, some unseen hand is going to turn things around pretty soon. <laughs> I just want to give a time check. We have 30 minutes left for our yeah. discussion. I think we've set a lot of the context. We're now going to pick up the pace because we've got a lot of ground to cover when it comes to Africa's next challenge. Hans, I haven't been ignoring you, sir. I'm coming to you because of the recent reports about Barclays PLC pulling out 
or reducing their exposure to emerging markets and one of those territories being sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm going to ask you what your what do you use to assess the level of risk in an economy and what would make you pull out? This goes to the doom and gloom side of the conversation, Prime Minister, that you alluded to earlier. Probably talking to the wrong guy. I, mean, I think we never have left the country that we've entered in. So, so I, I think in long term, there's always challenges in different countries. Um, I so think, you're there for thick orphan? Absolutely. I mean, of course, uh, if we're not allowed to be there, we will not be there. But we are long term and we think we're, we're working with infrastructure, we're working with services, we're trying to educate our employees. I mean, for us, it's super important to be in all these countries. We're working with scalable solutions worldwide. I say, say, sell the same technology in New York as I said to Rwanda or to Ethiopia. It's the same technology. So for us to be all that, getting all the different exposures, the needs of Africa, how we build our technology for that is super important. I think that when you, when you are, of course, understand the challenges you have in raw material, volatility and all of that, it comes back to what the President Kogami said. That's also the time when you need to think smarter. Uh, that you ne always need to act upon a crisis. I think that's the best moment. Thinking about how can you work differently? How can you be more efficient? I mean, thinking about the tools that are getting into Africa. And yes, I sound like a parrot coming back to ICT. But that is coming naturally into the whole whole continent. The connectivity, mobility, broadband and cloud is coming into Africa in big. All the, all, almost all Africans will almost have a smartphone five years from now. Think about what you can do as a government using that tool in order to get education, information, public services in a much more efficient way than you do today. Once you have energy. Yeah, energy, of course. Today, you're doing it without energy, but you're doing it with, with fuels that are, uh, that of course, waste, diesel, etc. Of course, it's much better to have electricity that are renewable and, and all of that. So, yes, we need to go hand in hand, but we don't need to wait for that because it's going to still happen. The technology will come out. I am going to pull from two private investors in the African continent uh, in our audience. Uh, Jeffrey White is the CEO of Agility, a large logistics multinational investing in the African continent or on the African continent rather. Jeffrey, please keep it very, very brief. I'm just giving Hans some support, being the only private sector voice oh, yeah. on the panel. I feel very alone here. Also going to UN uh, Global Ambassador Helen Hai, who's sitting in the front here. I'd like to also get your thoughts, but please keep it brief. I've got skills development to talk about. We've got a lot more ground to cover. Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Um, so we're investing across the continent in building physical distribution networks. And I actually think Africa's next challenge in relation to the, the fourth uh, industrial revolution is probably the wrong term. Because what I believe from an African perspective is we've got challenges in relation to power, in relation to infrastructure, and those are historic challenges that are being solved and, and worked on. I actually think the fourth industrial revolution brings a huge opportunity for Africa to actually embrace it. And if you look what happened with the cell phone market, Africa took a quantum leap from having no cell phones to using cell phones to transform the economy for accessing information, um, accountability, traceability, and everything. And I think an awful lot of what I've heard in Davos in the last uh, two days is all about the fourth industrial revolution, that actually if Africa embraces it, will be another quantum leap that Africa can take to catch up. Helen, can we get your, your contribution? Jeffrey, would you mind uh, passing the mic there to, to Helen? Uh, I'm so glad to hear industrialization from everybody uh, because China is moving from a labor intensive economy to a capital in intensive economy. 85 million jobs is currently leaving uh, from China. So it, clearly there's a great golden opportunity for Africa to tap that. And I'm also hearing at 2025, there's this energy uh, project. But how about the coming five years? Because all those jobs is relocating out of China now. Is Africa ready in the next five years to grasp that? to grasp that. And that's a question actually for Prime Minister uh, uh, of Ethiopia. And another question I'd like to raise is, in last November, uh, during the China-Africa Collaboration Forum, China uh, talked about five collaboration pillars with Africa and 10 projects. Out of the 10 projects, the top one is to help Africa to build industrialization. Second one is to help Africa build a modern agriculture industry. Third one is to support Africa on finance. Fourth one is on in infrastructure development. And uh, as a result of it, China committed to give 60 billion to Africa in the coming 
uh, three years. What's your view? I mean, I would like to get the view from the president of Rwanda to talk about the China-Africa relationship in the coming few years. So I'm going to pause on the China-Africa relationship. I'm going to bring it to digitization, which again is the underpin of the uh, fourth industrial revolution. I'm talking about a smart Rwanda, a partnership with Ericsson. This was started in uh, March 2015. What benefits are you reaping of the smart Rwanda? This is about the transformative nature of technology that Hans has been alluding to, Mr. President. There are huge benefits already we are seeing, and uh, there are more to come. Uh, we work with Ericsson for Smart Rwanda and uh, other technology companies, uh, and we are seeing that the convergence of, for example, bringing together the side where business education and, and research, and also finance. We, we, these things are coming together. So on the side of uh, companies, startups, or existing uh, businesses uh, coming together, we have created a, a special uh, economic zone where we have, for example, had these startup companies and existing companies coexisting and living side by side with the uh, anchor tenants like uh, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, we are now having um, uh, Institute of uh, Theoretical Physics coming in to help with that, and then uh, companies uh, in this area like Ericsson and others. Uh, involved in, in this area coming together, as well as what we have also created in terms of uh, innovation fund, in fact, which uh, African Development Bank is supporting as well. So when we bring these three uh, components together, they demonstrate that this getting together and working together for the common interests we're talking about in the digital development and associated benefits can happen, and we just scale that up. So that is already becoming obvious. And, but again, this is not an end in itself. It, it also has to, you have to make sure that this is linked with the understanding and involvement and the participation of uh, the general public. The citizens have to participate in, in all of this, and it has to be uh, geared towards uh, the growth that we want, but also growth that is inclusive and associated with development. Mr. Vice President, I'm bringing you back in here. I need some more context around Nigeria, given its importance to the region. You are the largest economy by GDP. You've got the largest population. Boko Haram, safety and security has been a key concern. Uh, also <coughs> corruption and how the new administration is dealing with both of these issues. Please can you use this forum to give us an update on that front. Again, this comes back to our topic because it directly affects foreign direct investment which has been dropping in Nigeria, sir. Um, well, as far as uh, Boko Haram is concerned, um, what uh, we know now is that um, militarily Boko Haram has been practically almost completely degraded. So in terms of, of military force or power, uh, Boko Haram is virtually non-existent. But of course you find uh, suicide bombings and uh, bombing soft targets and, and uh, that kind of activity. And that really is what may constitute the current threat. We're trying to move people back to their, to their homes, uh, to their homesteads, especially in areas like Maiduguri which are the worst in areas like Borno State, which uh, is in the Northeast, and which are possibly, which uh, is probably one of the worst hit areas. And um, the other areas, Adama and Yobe, are relatively stable. So we think that in terms of a real uh, existential threat, uh, Boko Haram has been substantially uh, degraded, and we don't, we, we don't consider that that is a significant problem. Uh, today, But of course, we've got to deal with the fallout of that. We've got huge numbers of IDPs, huge numbers of persons who have been displaced. Uh, the economy of that region uh, has, has, of course, uh, practically been devastated. So 
there are huge uh, human and social concerns, huge economic concerns, which we have to deal with. The corruption issue? Yeah, well, corruption we're dealing with. Uh, and um, of course, we actually came to office on that, on that platform that we will deal with issues of corruption and transparency generally and ensure that there is uh, proper governance. The, the, the thing though is that for us, the right approach, I mean, aside from ensuring that there is consequence for corruption, the right approach really is to improve uh, our, our systems across board, to ensure that we have systems that are transparent, that uh, systems that anyone can interrogate, anyone can audit, systems that people can pass through without bottlenecks. Because really, I mean, rent-seeking and corrupt behavior is really uh, instigated largely by systems that are opaque and uh, not transparent. So our emphasis is on developing systems that work, that are smooth, that uh, don't have uh, the, the, the number of bottlenecks that there are. Yes. Can, I, can I say something about the, the issue of um, the foreign direct investment? Because I think we need to be clear that Africa's economy is not unwrapped. It, they are not unraveling at all, right? Africa is a very resilient region, right? Don't forget that for the last 10 years, Africa was growing 5.8%, almost 6%, right? Even now with the economic downturn that we have, the slow growth in Europe mm -hmm. and also the weakening demand, despite that, the projection is that Africa will grow about 4.4%. So Africa is still the place to invest. Now, foreign direct investment coming to Africa is still about almost close to $70 billion, right? Now, the governments in Africa are doing great things. The Vice President just mentioned this, and the President of, of, of Rwanda is doing a fantastic job, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, in general macroeconomic management, in fiscal management, in times of the cost of doing business in Africa has gone down tremendously. And in, you know, just take a look at, across. So Africa still remains, in fact, to Ellen's point, the place to really invest. Now, what we need to do is look for the opportunity in the current situation. You are mentioning the case of China. Now, China has excess industrial capacity right now, right? But if you look at the industrial wages in China, you compare the industrial wages to that in Africa. Industrial wages in Africa, it's about 25% of what they are right now in China. So even as China looks internally to build its economy through domestic uh, consumption, right, and it wants to externalize its industries, Africa is the place to go. What you're doing in Ethiopia is fantastic for leather. I mean, we are here in Davos. It's very cold here in Davos, right? But everybody has to wear shoes, right? Africa produces a lot of leather, right? We've got a population of 1.1 billion people, going to be 2 point something billion people. President Adeshina, I've got to bring no, no, it back. I, so I was 16, 16 yeah, minutes I, left. Yeah, Concluding but just comment, let me, please. Let sir. me finish that point. The, the point I'm trying to make is that Africa needs to develop industrial growth engines. Yeah. And those industrial growth engines is what's going to actually drive foreign direct investment that's going to mobilize the domestic capital markets for us to grow and develop. You know, we can't develop simply depending on others. You know, we've got to grow domestic capital markets. We've got to make sure that we, we, we mobilize our sovereign wealth funds. We've got a trillion dollars <throat> in pension funds in Africa today. We're talking about infrastructure. We, the resources to do that, they are hey. actually available right here. In Can Africa. we spend the last 15 minutes talking about skills development Absolutely. and how important that is Absolutely. to this conversation? Because Prime Minister and then Hans Westberg, I want you to come in. One thing is having technology. So first we have the power, then we have the technology. But how to use it and what to do with it is incredibly important. So science, technology, engineering, maths. Yes. Are we making the necessary investments? Prime Minister, followed by Hans. Uh, first of all, I would like to comment on uh, China-Africa uh, cooperation, which is the best cooperation I ever know as far as developing countries uh, are concerned. I think that platform is important to be mentioned. When you come to uh, any kind of development, it means technology, technological upgrading and accumulation. So we should have a vibrant science technology from the kindergarten up to our university systems. Uh, that's very important for the future of Africa. So we have to work on skills development as well as uh, uh, science, technology, mathematics, and, and all those uh, issues very essentially well designed in Africa. Hans? No, I think coming back to foreign direct investments and education because they are very paired. Of course, doing foreign, foreign direct, direct investment, it's really much about infrastructure, transparent, the country's working. But one thing that is enormously important for Africa, of course, is to have 
their own labors, that we have the competence in Africa. Uh, we have uh, uh, Ethiopians working for, for Ericsson Ethiopia. We have S South Africans working for us. And that has to, of course, that competence has to go up because infusing people from other continent that's going to be there for a while will not make the growth for Because for there's a fear that technology is also going to replace jobs. No, I don't think so. That will make efficiency. And I think that is a, a, a misconception that the technology revolution will actually reduce jobs. It is the biggest opportunity for Africa. You can leapfrog. We heard uh, earlier that's the leapfrog you can do. You can get inclusion of the African continent by using education. It's not reducing possibilities. But again, it's really about also getting that labor, that competence that is needing for doing that in each and every country. That will get, grow in consumption, in domestic consumption, so the money is not flowing out. And that will be between, between the countries. And again, technology will play a vital role. So don't forget that. Is leadership surrounding themselves with the right skills? President Kagame, you're in an unpredictable environment. Earlier we said technology is, new technology is being developed and it's difficult to govern that technology. Are you engaging the right people to help you make the decisions that you're gonna to have to make in this somewhat explosive technological industrial revolution? Absolutely, and in fact, uh, some of those that you work very closely with, Ericsson, as we said, we work with Ericsson, with Cisco, with the different, these are the best advisors in terms of technology and they are producers of technology. But let me add something and uh, adding to what uh, Hans has just said. Before people get worried about uh, technology uh, replacing uh, you know, people and, or displacing them from jobs, why don't we also concentrate on making sure that we use technology for the right reasons, which is increasing productivity. And if we did that, then it is easier to see which technology is, <coughs> is harmful, if at all. And then from there, we can manage that as a different problem. But there is blurring of lines here. People talk about technology, taking away jobs, and so on and so forth. And forget that actually in Africa, for example, we have deficit of technology and how to use it for productivity and higher productivity. So how do we start getting worried about another problem when we haven't dealt with the first one? It comes back so, sir, to education, though, and yeah. to the skills development that we were referring to so yes. that people can work alongside the technology. They yeah. can augment that technology. I see you want to come in here, President Yeah, I, I want to come in because yeah. I, I want to link the, the point that um, of technology, science technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, and uh, with the industrial development. There is no doubt that we need the right kind of skills. But what we have in Africa is a total disconnect between the needs of the labor market and actually the kind of skills that people are having. Our universities are giving people labels, but they're not giving them the competences that the labor market needs. So we've got to bridge that disconnect. The second thing is that we at the African Development Bank are supporting actually the uh, Carnegie Mellon University in, in Rwanda. Um, to actually train a new generation of Africans that are actually first class in terms of computer technologies and stuff like that, which will actually help Ericsson's and all the others uh, uh, in Africa. But I do want to say that we need to look at uh, developing in Africa, in my view, what we call you know, skills enhancement zones. What do I mean quickly? Is that we've got to connect Agro, I mean, clusters of industries where students come out of universities and they get exposed to skill sets whether it is in you know, healthcare industry, agriculture, whatever engineering, whatever Ericsson and all of that. And so that they have the broad set of skills that labor market needs. And some of the ministers of finance are here that you can then use the fiscal incentives to encourage those companies to hire from these <coughs> skills enhancement zones. So that way you shorten the search cost for Ericsson and so on, look in the labor market. You make the labor market entry much easier and then you link the skills and industrial development together. I think this is very fundamental. But one last point we must pay attention to is education. Don't forget, by 2050, only 6% of Africans will have completed tertiary education. And by that time, the technologies will have gone fast. So what we need to do is accelerate education, 
primary education, science and technology training, but making sure we fast track access to tertiary education. Everything comes down to skills. And don't forget, vocational training is gonna be very crucial in this fourth industrial revolution. Minister Adeshina, I'm gonna do something that I don't generally do now. We've got eight minutes left of the broadcast. I'm going to give each of the panelists, I'm gonna divide it equally. You're going to get concluding remarks, but I want you to touch on whether the fourth industrial revolution excites you or terrifies you in the African context. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, I'm starting with you. Well, it certainly excites, certainly excites me because the truth is that for those of us who have large numbers, those countries that have large numbers such as we have, we absolutely have no choice but to, to, to go the way of technology. I mean, look at e-learning, for instance, and using electronic tablets to teach large numbers of people, using mobile phones to teach large numbers of people. We have millions of, of, of people to teach. There's absolutely no way of catching up with all of the teaching requirements within the time that we have, if we're going to rely on conventional teaching methods. So now we're, in, we're, we're investigating all of the possibilities. We're looking at mobile phones as possibilities for teaching. We're looking at training 500,000 teachers in the next few months. How are we going to do that without technology? It's absolutely impossible. I think that the truth is that you can't, there, there, there's absolutely no way of getting around technology in any event, it is the way forward, it is the way of progress. Whatever the cost may be, my, my, my take is, is that the upside is absolutely incredible. The opportunities are, are great, and I think that we should really go for it and, and ensure that we're a big part of it. Yeah. We're going to mix it up. No protocol here. Hans Westberg, you're up next, sir. I think it's just amazing. I mean, I'm spending time with the UN many years, and here I'm on a panel with three distinguished guests and head of states, and then talk about technology, what I do every day. Uh, I think we're coming far away. I think I see excitement, I, I see opportunities. The challenge is, of course, to, to scale it, to see that you can scale the solutions and have uh, sort of the, the possibility for the collaboration uh, and between public and private, and ultimately, we need bold leaders that actually embrace the technology transformation happening on the continent to make that a public service. I think that's the most important. You're notably excited. Prime Minister. Yeah, um, it excites me because uh, it, puts, uh, it gives us huge opportunity in front of us uh, to leapfrog, uh, to catch up. But it also terrifies me if we go business as usual, we'll be in a disastrous situation. You've got a little more time, sir. Do you not want to use? Do, I, I can't so use it. All right, there we go. President. Let me, let me, let me use it. All right, we've got President Adeshina and President Kagami taking your time. I can't right. use it. You're time. giving it up. But I, but I, President but I think I'm, I'm so super excited um, because to actually take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution requires energy. So I think energy revolution in Africa is critical for that. And you know, in the next five years, the African Development Bank will put in. $12 billion into the energy sector and leverage about 40 to $50 billion on that is new deal on energy for Africa and a transformative partnership. The other one is that we need a skills revolution in Africa. You know, we need to make sure we upgrade the skills and capacities to actually do the right kind of technologies and to connect into uh, many of these new industries. At the end of the day, I think we also need a jobs revolution because we've got a population of young people, they are very restless, they are very smart, but they're looking for jobs. So as we actually do technology, as we industrialize, as we solve Africa's energy problem, we will not just be excited, it will be the hundreds of millions of young Africans that will be excited because the opportunities have finally come for them. And I think our role, both as leaders in Africa, is to unlock that opportunity, we have no choice. Do you want some more time, sir? I have one more time. I can go ahead. <laughs> you can go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to give you. I've got four minutes left, President Kagami. I'm holding, I'm holding time for you. You want to add yeah, one more thing? Yeah, but I just want to, to, to say that we need public-private partnership in everything that we're talking about. If we talk about these leaders, all that they're doing is providing what I call um, public sector-enabled, private sector-led industrialization. So create the enabling environment for the private sector to invest. This is going to be very critical. Governments are not going to be able to do everything. The private sector is critical uh, in all these things that we are talking about. And I think that, you know, the last point I'll just make is that, 
you know, most times when we talk about the opportunities for Africa, we're constantly looking outside. We must look inside. The Vice President mentioned domestic resource mobilization. We've got to mobilize our sovereign wealth funds. We've got to mobilize our pension funds. We've got to actually make our capital markets to, to work well so that we can actually use our own resources on our terms to develop in the trajectory that Africa needs to go. And I think that is really where the opportunities lie for us. And I think I've used up enough time. President Kagame, <laughs> they've been very generous. You've got three minutes left. Oh, yes, I think fourth industri industrial revolution is very exciting. And, and uh, all it means is uh, uh, the benefits that uh, accrue to uh, producing uh, as well as consuming, which I think we need to reverse in our own case in Africa. We need to also start producing technologies rather than just being uh, consumers. So, but that will come if we continue doing some of the things we are doing. Education, education, science, technology, mathematics, and management of that is something we need to continue to, to, to invest in. And people, for us in Africa, we also don't need to just be thinking of fourth industrial revolution and forget that there is a job that has not been concluded in terms of even uh, being uh, at the right level with the third industrial revolution. So we, in my view, I have a step in the third industrial revolution and I have another step ahead in the fourth industrial revolution. And I have to make sure that I'm doing a good job of that so that we continue forward. The other point is people get worried about fourth industrial revolution in terms of uh, displacement of jobs and so on and so forth, artificial intelligence and 3D printing that may have harmful side effects and so on and so forth. But remember, we are the ones making these technologies. I think our intelligence, our own intelligence must be smarter than the actual artificial intelligence. No, so, <laughs> let's, make, let's use our own intelligence to make sure that we manage the artificial intelligence yes. and get the good side of it. Absolutely. I think that's my take. Gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure with that spirited debate on Africa's next challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That's it from the CNBC Africa debate, coming to you live from the World Economic Forum, which is currently in session in Davos. Thank you.